I would like to know why, at the age of 90, I've had to sign a piece of paper in order to be on this show to say I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Jack Whitehall. In the news this week, after finally receiving the long-awaited Leveson report, David Cameron takes immediate action. <laughs> At a casting session for the Magic Roundabout musical, Nigel Havers really nails his audition for the part of Zebedee. And at River Cottage, Hugh Fernie Whittingstall is spotted coming home from John Lewis with a brand new meat cleaver. <laughs> <laughs> with Ian tonight is a member of the House of Lords and the oldest guest we have ever had on this show. It would be ungallant of me to tell you her ladyship's age, so let's just say she was born before this programme started and before BBC One started, <laughs> and before television started. <laughs> Please welcome Baroness Trumpington! <laughs> and with Paul is a familiar face from The Apprentice, who, as a PR man, spent 21 years with Alan Sugar at Amstrad, and he's still working. Unlike most Amstrads. <laughs> Please welcome Nick Hewer. Oh, how could I know. We start with the biggest stories of the week. Ian, Baroness Trumpington, take a look at this. That's Hugh Grant. That isn't. That's Lord Leveson. Cameron, on the phone to Rebecca. Yeah, I've read it. <laughs> uh, that's the Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, bringing in the tea for the Cabinet. And that's a really bad reenactment. <laughs> so what, what side are you on on this, if any? I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct side. <laughs> <laughs> you see, they're not all bad, the House of Lords. <laughs> Ian, would you care to summarise the Leveson well, report? Yes, I mean, there are four volumes of it and a summary and... We've actually got them here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there they are. The summary is that, um, they, you know, essentially the press behaved abysmally. Um, he's slightly um, kinder to the police, who behaved quite abysmally and two kinds of the politicians who he says didn't behave that abysmally. Obviously, my view is that they all did. Um, so you think a free press is I think important. a free press is a good idea, which is obviously, you know, a <laughs> heretical view. You say you're in favour of a free press. Does that include telephone uh, listening in? Uh, no, what, what I'm in favour of is a free press that obeys the law. And there is a law against all the things that came up in the report. Telephone hacking, bribery of policemen, um, harassment, privacy, all those things I think are covered by the law. They weren't um, enforced by the police because they were in the pocket of the press, who were in the pocket of the politicians, in fact, by Mr Cameron himself. So I think you had a... I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did say you were listening to me, so I thought I'd just give it a wang, really. Uh, how much would this cost you? Do you know how much this would, this would cost you? 250 quid. That's my copy. 250 quid? Yeah. This is yours. Would you like that for Christmas? Mm. Do you want it? If, if it's Here wrapped with consideration, yeah, I'll have it, yeah. I give you all presents. <laughs> Baroness, I bought you Fifty Shades of Grey. Which is... <laughs> no, <laughs> you've already got it. <laughs> how did Sky News report David Cameron's reaction to the report? Leave it, Leveson, or I'll cut your <laughs> shouted murder up from behind your curtain. <laughs> <laughs> what did uh, Lord Justice Leveson do immediately after the press conference? Well, he ordered a bottle of whiskey and he said, I've just wasted 14 months of my life. <laughs> <laughs> he flew off to Australia. He's gone to join I'm a Celebrity. Yes, get me out. Yeah. <laughs> On the subject of much loved figures, mm. uh, did you see um, Piers Morgan's response on Twitter? Yes. 
Yeah. You did? Didn't. No. No! <laughs> <laughs> I did look up the bit about Piers Morgan in that report. I'll be honest. Mm. I know it's 700,000 million words, yeah. but the four or five about Piers are well worth a look. <laughs> Can you remember what they were? Yeah, Lord Levson didn't find his um, description of um, phone hacking and how he'd never done any entirely convincing. That's all I'm going to say. Go and read it for yourselves. <laughs> the, you know, the Conservatives don't want statutory underpin regulation. The Labour You're Party lying, do. You're lying, Moe Morgan, thing... you toe rag. <laughs> <laughs> Come this side of the Atlantic and face the committee instead of talking via internet satellite. <laughs> you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> yeah. What did he Twitter then? Sorry. Oh, yes, what was the tweet? His tweet was, Taxi 4 at hacked off Hugh. Oh, very funny, Piers. I, my, my response would be, police car for peers. <laughs> <laughs> Trial for peers. <laughs> Big angry cellmate that misses his wife for peers. <laughs> You'd have to miss her an awful lot, wouldn't you? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what evidence is there as well for the public losing interest in the whole thing? That's linked to Hugh Grant. Um, they haven't lost interest, have they? Well, last night, his documentary, Taking on the Tabloids, mm. um, was only viewed by 552,000 viewers, which is 75% down on the average. Countdown gets lots more than that. Yeah. <laughs> Me and the Baroness were watching TOWIE. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I, think I think they are interested. Perhaps it's just me, but, uh, yeah, Are you interested? Right. Are you still interested? Yeah. yeah. And the Go Hugh on. Grant thing, you back that campaign, yeah? I think that's good. Anything that keeps Hugh Grant away from acting, you should really... <laughs> Um, yes, this is the long-awaited release of the Leveson Report, which has called for outside regulation to make sure the press regulate themselves. Despite having read the exchange of personal texts between David Cameron and Rebecca Brooks, Lord Leveson described the relationship between politicians and the press as being in robust good health. Lol. <laughs> Packed off released a statement saying they were bitterly disappointed with David Cameron's response. And from now on, they're going to be known as f***ed off. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of which, my daughter-in-law taught him at school, you know. She said he was a very naughty boy. Really? And he fiddled in the margins. He did what? Was <laughs> <laughs> oh, that a pub? <laughs> Paul and Nick, take a look at this. Yes. Uh, this is the new governor of the Bank of England. He's a Canadian bloke. I don't know his name. Carney. <laughs> Carney. Oh, there's some money. Uh, just to make sure we know we're in Canada. There's, there's Canada in 1948. <laughs> uh, maple syrup, just to indicate that we are in Canada. Oh, and there's a moose that says Canada. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a bit odd that we can't find somebody to run the bank. We've got to go to Canada. Yeah. I know they're terribly prudent, Norris, but it's the same in football, isn't it? Yes. They're all foreign. Foreign, foreign managers. Yeah. nobody yeah. worth a damn here anymore. Yeah. Jack? Mm. Is it not well, quite a good idea having a, a foreigner running the banking system for a bit? Has I mean, he got our, our interests at great. heart? Has he got our interests yeah, at heart? Exactly. Working for the Canadians. Canadians yeah. are well known enemies over and all these years. And what's over the board exactly. from Canada? Oh, yeah, Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> but Canada survived best out of all the countries in the West yeah. out of this financial recession. So they've decided why don't we get someone in? We can't seem to do it. Let's get in a Canadian. Yeah. It's not a totally useless move. No. Let's have a look at yeah, Mark let's. Carney. Do you know how the Express described him? They said that he bears a distinct likeness to George Clooney. Let's have a look at him again. I mean, I look more like George Clooney than him. Nick mm, looks no. more like George Clooney than him. <laughs> the Baroness looks more like George Clooney than him. <laughs> Would you like to see George Alagaya asking mm. a very straightforward question? Mm, yeah. Robert, George Osmond says he's the best in the world. What's he got, Mark Carney, that no one in Britain apparently has not? <laughs> and what about money? How much is George Carney getting 600 paid? 600-odd, wasn't it? Exactly. £624,000 a year, which is not bad. He Although... can always go and top it up downstairs, can't he, if he's a bit short? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't you sort? Yeah, take, take home perks. Me. Comes in in the morning, thin bloke, goes home at night, big fat bloke wearing an <laughs> <laughs> it's put into perspective, though, this week by Harry Redknapp, who's become a manager of a football club and is being paid £3 million a year, which, after tax, is £3 million a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, a question about Major Perk. It's been up there for a while. Question about Major Perk? Yeah. 
Is that a man? I don't know. <laughs> is he a friend of general commotion? <laughs> <laughs> Corporal punishment <laughs> and private matter. <laughs> According to the Independent, yeah. there is one major perk that comes with being governor of the Bank of England. Ah, oh, very good. What is it? You're allowed to take whatever whatever sticks to your hand. You can take over. <laughs> No, the answer is the impressive ensuite thunderbox in the governor's parlour. Whoa! It's like a big loo, right? Oh, you're referring to um, Fat Pang and Fat his uh, appearance before the uh, select committee. Did you oh. read about that? Yes, this is Lord Patton. Oh. And he felt they were asking far too many questions about the BBC and what it had got up to. Well. And he said, next you'll be wanting to know about my toilet habits. I met him once, you know. <laughs> I was in uh, need of stapler at the time. Um, and I was at Wembley for the last Tory shindig before the 92 election and I was handling a speech and I looked around and I said, has anybody got a stapler? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll get one. Mm. And he rushed off and as good as his word, he came back and he had one and gave it to me. Very nice man. Sticks with me. Yeah. <laughs> got you a stapler. But what Thank of you. his toilet habits? <laughs> he doesn't use a stapler for that. No. <laughs> he doesn't need to. Have you got two Tories on the panel tonight? I'm Labour. Oh, you're like, you, were, you were just at a Tory shindig? Yeah. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> That's the level our debate sunk to. <laughs> Next time he talks, I'll make a fart noise. <laughs> um, Can I go home now? <laughs> <laughs> Can I come with you? <laughs> Banking is a bit dry. Would we like to cheer ourselves up by watching Boris do the Mobot? <laughs> Yes. No. <laughs> 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 Did he know he was being filmed? <laughs> <laughs> that could be your next leader. God. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, the Mobot was a bit of a craze, but you've um, you've actually started the V-Bot. What should we call it? Your moment in the House of Lords. I have to tell you that that noble lord and I have been friends for many, many years. This is Lord King. But you at first denied that you'd flicked him the V's, or did you say that you had? So I'll stop doing it now. <laughs> it is rather catching. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you regret swearing at him, or...? No, because uh, I regretted what he said, which was that people of my age were starting to look very, very, very old. Well, wouldn't you do that if you were told? <laughs> Yeah, I can see this is the news that the Canadian Mark Carney is to become the first foreigner to run the Bank of England. Yeah, tell that to you, Kip. <laughs> According to the Times, Mr Carney has negotiated a salary of 624000 although, obviously, if he screws it all up and resigns early, he'll get massively more under the Entwistle Clause. <laughs> Ian and Baroness Trumpington, here's another one for you. UKIP. Someone saying I'm voting UKIP. Farage, because he's the only one. <laughs> no, he's not, actually. Lots of them are. Look at him. He's so glum. This is the news. I'm... Well, it's happening now. Mm. So when you see this, you'll know. UKIP will have won a seat. The Conservative Party will have formed a coalition with UKIP in a desperate I attempt to stay so. in power. I hope not. <laughs> 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 Frankly, I think it's a, a most horrible setup. I really what, UKIP? Do. Yes. Right. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, then. Yeah. This is actually the, uh, the row over foster children being buffeted around by cheap politics well, as UK milk. Yes. How did uh, Nigel Farage describe the decision by Rotherham Social Services? Baffling. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Baffling. <laughs> <laughs> He was actually right for a change, though. Um, yeah. The reason given by Rotherham Council for taking the Eastern European children away? That the foster parents were members of UKIP. Yeah. The foster mum claimed, we don't know or care about the immigration policy, we just agree that we should get out of the EU. <laughs> There's so few people willing to foster kids anyway, that to say, well, UKIP people can't do it, just seemed to be absolutely amazing. Put them back in care, that's worked well. 
Oh, no, it hasn't. Is the idea that they'll be brought up as racists to hate themselves, is that, is that, the, is that the fear? Yeah. No, I think they'll that's... wake up in the morning and punch themselves in the <laughs> face? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the children never sort of follow what their parents do. Ian's parents were both in The Grateful Dead, but look <laughs> at him. I mean... <laughs> Uh, UKIP are outraged that they and their supporters are being accused of being racist, but how did David Cameron describe them in 2006? Fruitcakes. Yeah. Yes. Loonies. A bunch of fruitcakes and loonies and closet racists. <laughs> I like this phrase, closet racist. I have a friend, he's just come out as a racist, but he doesn't know whether he's a racist or not. He's still a bit confused. <laughs> he's, uh, by furious. <laughs> And uh, why, why is this a bad time for Cameron and the Tories to be antagonising UKIP? Because UKIP are getting a lot of votes, the country's getting more Eurosceptic, and a lot of Tories are threatening to desert. Not a lot. OK, hardly any. Better. <laughs> <laughs> there was someone in your party who suggested that there should be a coalition between yes. UKIP and the Conservatives. The man you talk of is uh, Michael Fabricated yep. Hair. Um, here is a picture of Michael Fabricated <laughs> Hair. Um, Michael Fabricant suggested a pact with UKIP so that they would not stand against the Conservatives in the next election. We actually got tweeted earlier on. Just had a Have I Got News For You on the phone asking for a picture of Litchfield MP Mike Fabricant. And then he tweeted back saying, Gosh, I'm to be a question on Have I Got News For You? That's better than a knighthood. <laughs> It's not. We're, we're just making jokes about your appearance. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably going to be sat at home pulling out someone else's hair. Um, <laughs> what do they spend a lot of their money on at the EU? Meetings. Meet well, Pastries. It's actually wine. Wine? Uh -huh. Yeah. They were serving Bordeaux at £121 a bottle at the EU summit dinner. Cameron walked out and ate his dinner elsewhere. He wasn't going to be drinking any of that cheap plonk. <laughs> <laughs> Although, according to The Sun, he nipped back later for the cold meats and cheeses. <laughs> Paul and Nick, here's another for you. Mm. Oh, yes, OK, this is uh, a clip from George Melier's Voyage to the Moon. Um, that's a nuclear explosion. There was some story this week about, was it during the Cold War, the Americans were debating about whether they should blow up the moon with nuclear weapons. I'm not, I didn't quite see what they thought the point of that would be. It's because Hans Blix had told them that the Clangers had weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the little boy was the bomb they dropped on mm. Hiroshima. Yeah. So they were looking at something a lot bigger. Um, it was called a fat man. Would you like to see a picture of a fat man? Yeah. See? This is the actual bomb. You thought we were going to show you something like this. The, um... No. <laughs> It's Eric Pickles. He's a, um, a member of the Cabinet. Have you well, ever heard of him? Yes, I certainly have, but I, I didn't realise he was that large. <laughs> <laughs> what was the reason why they wanted to do this? It was like, I think it was sort of posturing, because uh, the Russians had launched Sputnik, so they wanted to make a statement and surprise the Russians mm. by blowing <laughs> up the moon. <laughs> Yeah, nothing happened. Sanity in the prevailed. End. Yeah, because there were doubts over what effect a moon blast could have on Earth, including tidal patterns. Mm. Mm. Talking of which, floods uh, in this country have now got serious because a celebrity has been affected. Which celebrity? What's the initials? P D. Is it P Diddy? <laughs> <laughs> Paul Daniels. Paul, Paul Daniels. Daniels. Paul Daniels. He lives yeah. by the River Thames. Correct. He Paul... lives on a little island. Yeah. Yes. yes. Paul Daniels said this week that he was furious with the council and that his house was currently under about two foot of flooding. He's been flooded every year for years and he keeps moaning about it. <laughs> <laughs> Get a sandbag, for God's sake. It's weird, is it, if you live next to the Thames and then complain about flooding? In the Thames? It's like moving in next door to Ryan Giggs and then complaining when he bangs your wife. Like... <laughs> <laughs> you surely knew when you moved into the area. <laughs> Um, this is America's plan in the 1950s to blow up the moon. The plan to fire a nuclear missile at the moon was codenamed Project A-119, although its purpose was later downgraded to finding a way of connecting Hartford and Stevenage. <laughs> <laughs> that is the actual road. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Earth, the UK was again hit by widespread flooding. One of the people affected was magician Paul Daniels. He was stranded in his house. The emergency services said, despite frantic efforts, they were running out of excuses not to rescue him. 
And so to round two, the picture spin quiz. Fingers on buzzers, teams. Oh, oh this is the uh, oh, this is the pigeon that they found yes. in the chimney. This is a code. It had a code tied to yes. its leg, and they couldn't they couldn't decipher it. Um, but they've deciphered it now, and, the, and, the, and it says, "Help! I'm trapped in this chimney." <laughs> <laughs> yes, this this is the news that so-called experts at GCHQ have failed to crack the coded message found attached to a World War II carrier pigeon yeah. skeleton and are asking the public for their help. It would be great if we had someone that worked as a code breaker during the war. <laughs> Surely that would be no problem for you. Enigma in a couple of years, a pigeon code, that couldn't be too hard. Should we have a look? <laughs> Should... yeah. Here is a picture of the bird's foot with the yeah. canister. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Th that's Yasser Arafat. Um, we... <laughs> <laughs> Safe journey home. <laughs> Would you like this show to go out as a tribute? <laughs> <laughs> I want JLS at my funeral. <laughs> um, is that some Palestinian no, group we haven't heard of? <laughs> <laughs> the message included 27 handwritten blocks of five letters. So, do you know what it says? No. No. <laughs> Um, this is the World War II code found attached to the leg of a dead pigeon, which experts have so far failed to decipher, apart yeah. from the words Dick Dastardly and Muttley. <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> looks as though he needs a good bra. <laughs> <laughs> There was a spoof article somewhere in the States, I think, saying yeah. he was the most sexy, charming, God, wasn't he gorgeous. And the Chinese People's Daily printed this as though it was absolutely true. <laughs> um, and their suspicions weren't roused by the previous winners, which included Assad... Yes. ..of Syria... <laughs> <laughs> ..and Piers Morgan. <laughs> 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 I've made that bit up. I have, the, I have the description that they gave of Kim Jong-un, mm. which was, this heartthrob is every woman's dream come true, with his devastatingly handsome round face, <laughs> his boyish charm, and his strong, sturdy frame. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Ah. <laughs> Who wants this last after eight mint? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having it. I'm having it. China's state-run paper, The People's Daily, has fallen for The Onion's online spoof naming Kim Jong-un as the sexiest man alive. The Onion is unavailable in North Korea, along with all other basic foodstuffs. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers on buzzers, teams. We say it's Andrew Marr. It is Andrew Marr. Ah, oh, yes, I know what this is. I saw this. Yes, the naturists of Great Britain complained that he was distorting history by showing uh, people from thousands of years ago walking around wearing clothes when they wore no clothes at all. It's more corruption at the BBC. Exactly that. A cover-up. <laughs> this is exactly the problem uh, that has been brought up by the British naturism. That's it. They say, apparently, the Australian Aborigines did yes. not wear loincloths. No. The Caribbean tribes did not wear shorts and dresses, mm. while early mm. tribes in Africa did not wear bikinis. Why do they always play ping-pong? Who? Naturists. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a soft ball, isn't mm. it, if an accident were to occur? I'd rather be hitting the balls with a ping-pong ball than say it's a tennis so, so ball. Talking about that, my little uh, grandson, he's got a bit of a lisp and he said, yeah. I've been kicked in the cream crackers. <laughs> that sounds rather sweet. That's lovely. He then said, somebody kicked me in the peanuts. <laughs> Should we not be even concerned about who's assaulting him on yeah. a regular basis? <laughs> <laughs> what excuse did the BBC give for the cover-up? You can't trust a naked woman with Andrew Marr. <laughs> <laughs> According to The Telegraph, yeah. it had been obliged to compromise accuracy to take into account the sensitivities of the audience. <laughs> yes, this is the latest BBC scandal, this time over full frontal nudity and their failure to show it to a peak-time family <laughs> audience on BBC One. In the BBC's defence, it's impossible to know for a fact whether people from ancient civilizations would have actually worn clothes, and as, of course, there's anyone that can remember. Perhaps they had very long beards. <laughs> It was also revealed this week that a contestant on Countdown was told by Channel 4 to cover up his offensive chest hair. It was so distracting that viewers almost forgot to look down Rachel Riley's top. 
the thing is, I'm right opposite her, and it's so difficult not to appear yeah, to be no. sort of, you know, <laughs> staring. It really is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> she probably thinks I'm sort of perving. Yeah. Which I'm not. No, you're not, no. It's no. professional interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you've definitely done a, a good, de like, good deal to dispel that, though, by saying... <laughs> I'm very proud of it, and I'm contemplating another contract. Ooh. So don't spoil it, Jack. Yeah, I'm not going to. Yeah. I love Countdown. Yeah. Good. Okay. Daddy likes it, he told me. I find it really weird when you say Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> you do speak to your Daddy, and you call him Daddy, and I think it's charming. And your father is one of the most amusing men I've ever met, mm. and I hope he's watching this in a strange sort of way. He might be, What, what do you mean, in a strange sort of way? What, with his head in the bucket? <laughs> <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words Round, which this week features, as a guest publication, the newsletter of ophthalmic antiques. We start with, oh, how I would love to what? Smoke inside. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did. You were a smoker, weren't you, Baroness? And her. When did you give up? Just roughly. Oh, well, about 102. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do now after sex? What did I want? Cigars. Cigars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I would love to polish the silver case, number 21.073, and the spectacles in it. What were the chances of us getting that right? <laughs> <laughs> Next, binge drink conk out and pushing up daisies what? I think it's Baroness Trumpington's list of things to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Binge, drink, conk out and pushing up daisies, all terms we got from the trenches. <laughs> Next, what go to school for mascots? Stupid mascots. Yeah, stupid mascots. <laughs> The answer is mm. Japanese students go to school for mascots. Oh, for God's sake. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new mascot school in Japan. Most football teams these days have a mascot. For example, Sunderland have this. It's a black cat. At least I think that's what John Terry called it. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Elton John's prescription in the late 70s was. Slightly stronger in the left than the right eye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope that's right. It's the most boring answer we've ever had. <laughs> uh, the answer is about 3.5D with a degree of oblique <laughs> astigmatism. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final scores are Ian and Baroness Trumpington have six points, but our winners are Paul and Nick with eight points. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. Oh. <laughs> Say something. <laughs> oh. Man has sex with elephant using telephone box as condom. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a trunk call? <laughs> <laughs> And I leave you with news that there's embarrassment on his first day at work as the new Archbishop of Canterbury locks himself out. Oh. <laughs> High above the streets of London, after suffering a breakdown, a stressed-out Dale Winton is gently coaxed back to safety. <laughs> and as he finally retires from politics, Ken Livingston throws a party for all of his friends and admirers. Good night. With two discs of highlights from the programme, the Have I Got News For You 2 audiobook is now available. Next up on BBC One, laughing at the highs of the Olympics and the lows of the economy, it's John Bishop's Big Year.